It's such a pleasure to be here amongst you. Many women, beautiful in and out, and men, beautiful in and out, uh, to talk about this topic. Um, because it's, uh, it's an, really an honor to be invited. Uh, and thank you, Kiwi, for including something like ethics, something sounding so ungraspable and so kind of far from what you are doing, probably. Can I just ask you, scan the audience, who codes anything? Yeah, sure. Who manages something? Great, okay. And who's just like looking or would want to go in tech? Good, okay. Let's, let's just start. Okay, so my talk is named Ethics. Why bother? You know, we are sitting there, or most of you are sitting there, just solving your problems. So why bother with something like ethics? Also, if you want to disagree with me or ask me anything aside from the amazing app, please include our institute name. I will talk about that later. Shameless plug will come. Um, so the internet kind of transitioned, right? A long time ago, actually late 80s, early 90s, into a commercial use, uh, which meant um, it fragmented and platforms appeared. I will be anchoring this talk about ethics on platforms because, because we all can imagine what those are and they're kind of right there, we all operate within them. And I will also be talking in simplified terms and also for the sake of time, because I will really try to keep that. And also uh, from the point of the user. So if you use it, if anyone uses it, what does that mean for the user? So platforms, right? They are businesses. They need monetization, which means they need relevancy for the user, which means they aim to retain that loyalty by ensuring that relevancy, by serving content that is relevant for the user. So it collects data, it processes them, it analyzes them, and then we get to the first kind of point. None of these are critiques, it's just something to think about. So we are entering an age in which most of us have a digital shadow online. We have a digital profile, we belong in some sort of group. And there are scholars and even, you know, people like you questioning our right to privacy. You must have heard it a million times, I'm sure, <laughs> but it's, it's an essential one to deal with. It's not resolved, it's not clear, there is no clear way how to you know, save it or <laughs> ensure that. Um, but there is this one issue. We will continue and then I'm very interested in your questions uh, at the end. Um, so with customization of the content to ensure relevancy and predictive algorithms, we are also effectively serving people, you know, what, what we think they think. So it's kind of predicting each one's desires and what they want to do. If you go on Google and you search, you automatically have a predetermined set of choices from which to pick out. If you go on Facebook, you know, I don't want to name any names, even though I just named them, but uh, yeah. And also freedom of association. Um, once again, I'm anchoring this in the um, basic human rights, because that's kind of most graspable in the legal kind of way. Uh, so freedom of association, why? Because if we go online, we are not only served the content that is suited to us, but to actually people with similar profiles. It's not served for Teresa, it's served for people with a profile like Teresa, with interests like Teresa. So, but we have no control over where we will be associated and with whom. Click, click. So that's why I say mass media are not that, you know. They are just not. It's just a different kind of mass. The mass is actually individual. We are serving content individually in masses, which is a kind of oxymoron, 
but it makes a lot of sense. The masses that we are speaking to are no longer in one geographical place. They are disseminated all over the world. And they are created by the processes that I mentioned before. So online structures, we all live in them, right? I, I bet we all go online and we already operate in some sort of structure on some sort of platform. There, we are kind of presented with a certain choice architecture. We are presented in choice architecture even in cities, even offline. This all is just a mirror of, you know, offline principles. So if, we, if you go to a city, you go into a building via a door, you would not think, oh, I can jump through a window. Well, maybe you could think that, but you wouldn't probably do that. Um, so it's already giving us some sort of guidance and creating a habit for us. So think about if you go every day, and probably some of us are guilty with starting so, uh, with social media uh, in the morning while you're still in bed, you're already going in that structure. You already know how to act in that structure, and um, it's characterized by the word on life that I very much like by Mr. Floridi, um, which is a philosopher here, uh, not here, <laughs> back in Oxford, uh, in the Digital Ethics Lab that actually advises not only governments but the big players in the world for uh, what's to come and kind of says, oh, maybe you should look out for this, for this. They usually don't listen, then come two years later being like, so what should, what should, what should we do? <laughs> so we live on life. Uh, online is tethered in our lives, it changes everything. We kind of are here because we know that, right? But when you have a structure that is inherently commercial and its profit in, it, in the end is, oh, its goal in the end is profit, um, you, would, you will start customizing uh, the environment people are in in a way that would make the most profit, that it's the most monetizable. Wow, that many engagements. Wow, you know, we can show him this or this or her, this and this. So I kind of start, started thinking about, um, well, I'm presented with all this makeup and, you know, because I started seeing makeup ads online because I very much fit into that profile very well. Um, and then I started going into and actually <laughs> kind of studying in my free time like special effects makeup. And I, I, once I, I just stopped and I asked myself, how did I get here? Like, I enjoy this very much, don't get me wrong. But how did I get here? I would never go into such a thing Shouldn't uh, if, I, if I didn't, you know, if I wasn't nudged that way. But this is a this is a great example. I went very much I, I like I explore this this area. But um, ask yourself what else can this nudge? It it creates a habit, and habit is such a powerful tool to actually change behavior of a person. But by changing a behavior of a person via one percent, for example, like the angle of one percent, where do you lead the whole society if it all adds up? So. As the latest airport book uh, by Covey uh, says, we become what we repeatedly do. It's the power of habit one. And I very much agree with that. And that's why we are, okay, that's why uh, this whole introduction kind of had to be said. So now, what do we want from algorithms? Oh, well, you know, sort through the information, deliver some sort of uh, result. But then we have to see the convenience trade-off with the golden cage trade-off. Where does it stop? Where do we stop the hyper-personalization, actually? Well, we just have to ask, who do we want to lead us? Them or us? So where does it cross the boundaries between being convenient and makes us less human or a different kind of human that we would be without them. This I found this morning, I found it quite interesting, because it's, you know, you listen to all of that, 
And you're like, yeah, but you know, we have the terms and conditions, like this is not our secret stuff. Of course it's not. But everybody goes there, everybody just clicks, gives the consent. And this is, by the way, from Planned Parenthood. <laughs> I don't know why Planned Parenthood would have fries in there. And uh, I'm, I was just so confused that I had to put it in. Uh, because it kind of, I can make some points on it. Because it's freely given, yeah, that should be, that should be. Um, nobody pressures you to use these things and the internet as a whole. Um, however necessary it might be right now. <laughs> um, reversible. Is it though? You know, with all the black architecture, you cannot really opt out. Um, but that's, that's just because it's fries. Then informed. That's the main one I want to stop at. The informed one. Um, not only people click and usually don't read them, uh, also guilty as charged, but um, how can you understand as a person that operates in the normal world outside of this room or even you and me, what the algorithms go off and how do they function and what implications do they have? That's the main big issue. Uh, enthusiastic, yeah, I'm very enthusiastic when going online. I don't know how about you. And specific, that's another one. Given that most algorithms and AI um, is a black box, how specific can we be while still being understandable and comprehensible? So that's the point that leads me to, is there really an awareness about these phenomena taking place? And how are, how are they disclosed? What kind of transparency is in place? There is a wild debate about transparency of algorithms, explainability of algorithms, you know, bias in algorithms, all of this. I want to focus more on the impact of, of, on the user, on, on each individual, because if um, the disclosure is not comprehensible, it's not really transparent at all. And if you, you explain it in the terms of a software engineer, to first grader, or a high schooler, or my mom, or my mom's friend, or anyone. Um, it's not really, it's not, it doesn't tell them much, right? We need something more. Um, so that also leads me to, uh, because human rights are built on human dignity and up underpinned by human dignity that states that, um, uh, you know, you should be informed um, and you should know which codes you obey by, and uh, in order to pra practice self-determination. As we said before, in order to choose where you want to end up and ask how did I end up here, and not be let there. So, we see ethics and values. It's, it's a big one, because one influences the other. So how do, we, how do we protect those values online? It's easily said and done, right? Because I can talk here for hours and we wouldn't still be able to solve the age-old questions. Like, okay, yeah, well, we, we need something to protect human rights and self-determination and human dignity. But, like, we want it to be good. We want it to be, you know, enabling um, technology. Uh, and we want, we want it to lead towards what we value. But what do we value? What do we value? And how can we encode it to ones and zeros when this is why philosophy exists? Um, also, who is we? You know, we can agree within one region, one room, maybe one very, very small room. Uh, but then who? You know, the internet, internet is transnational. So who should govern this? Who? should even say what good is. Um, so we are, uh, we are witnessing shifts in, um, in our lives right now and in, in, uh, in the dynamics of the world we live in. So grand, but it's true. Um, here we go, in bold. Um, so, for example, I think that the law of con conservation, uh, which you know holds for mass and uh, all of physics, holds online too. It does. It it actually holds throughout our lives. Um, but we need to ask, what is shifting them, and where? 
So we already mentioned this multiple times, but you know, reminder is always good. <coughs> there are shifts of power, uh, shifts of power over who gives us and encodes the values within a system. There are shifts of accountability. Who protects that? Who is responsible for the impact? Is it still nation states? I, would, I wouldn't say so. We are witnessing nation states kind of weakening by inter international corporations and big, big platforms that deal even with such things like, you know, even conflict resolution. We have courts for that. If you buy something, it's not delivered, you go to court, it's resolved, you're happy. But if you buy something now, if I buy something now from Amazon, it comes or it doesn't come, it's damaged or it's not there at all, I'm just gonna go through escalation of the conflict resolution on Amazon and it's cheaper for everyone, transactionally cheaper, even, you know, time-wise and all of these meanings of the word, cheaper, um, to just, for Amazon to just pay you off, give you the money back, you know, maybe suspend the, suspend the buyer. But it goes completely beyond um, nation states. It's virtually another layer of this sort of system in our society right now. So, do we really obey the code of law um, anymore? How, how effective is it? Especially in these areas where ethics are, are involved. There is already a theory, very good one, uh, by Lessig from 1999. Um, that code is law right now. We don't realize that, but in each age, we have a different regulator. But we are so focused on protecting ourselves from the government, from having privacy from the government, from, um, you know, the nation state narrative, that we forget that there is something completely else we operate in that actually regulates us right now. Oh, this is a fun one. You cannot even see that, but I have a bonus round. If that wouldn't be complicated and abstract enough, there is. Difficult to regulate due to nature because it's always changing, law is too, mm. too slow, innovation is too creative. Cross-jurisdictionary, transnational, it's always, it's always bad. Um, nation states are not even you know, agreeing on basic tariffs for phone bills. Pseudo-privacy, yeah, we can private, uh, uh, anonym, anonym, anonymize data, but you know, basic triangulation, five basic facts, you got the person. Data flows. Huh, we, have, we want health, healthcare everywhere, but what about nation states and big amount of data within healthcare? Power battle. There is a cold war going on in between states, in between regions, <laughs> USA and China. <laughs> um, governance structure, again, who are we? How do, how do we, you know, our biggest achievement in, in Europe is European Union and it's still messy and it's still problematic, even though very good. Um, bias and applicability, and then we go to the granular thing. What about data sets? It's not really transferable. Bonus, bonus round. We want it to be fair. What does that mean? Is it we want it to justice for everyone, or do we want everybody in, in, inflicted, no, inflicted, impacted by the same injustice? Not really, right? So universality is hard, context is everything, within AI, within algorithms, but especially within um, defining our values. And then we define it and we need to apply it. But internet does not stop outside of our home, right? Um, so we haven't solved the principles of morality offline. I would just like to stress that. It's an ongoing situation and debate. So. You know, how do we encode it? How do we put it to binary? So what? We are a business. <laughs> so many questions. Let's just forget about it. Yeah, I am getting the stop and I have like two, wait, I have like very quick, let's, let's take away from one question and, and finish this. You know, fuck everything, money is, fuck, fuck ethics, money is everything. This is coming from Facebook engineers. 
This is a concern coming from Stanford graduates that are really considering if they will follow the typical career of software engineer within all of the biggest giants that is very wanted by the world. But again, they realize that because they realize, oh, I have this immense power, but I don't know if it's good. So we are at a frontier. We are only starting to realize what the impact is and what it will be. And we are basically coding the next generation. So what do you want the future to be? And given that we are already in the future and we are living these principles and these things are taking place right now, what do you want your future to be in five years, 10 years? Maybe Jesus, poor Jesus. You know, we, we, we used to describe the world. Now we create it. We create something from nothing. This is from Aristoteles Platon because I'm a sucker for philosophy. But we create something from nothing. Yeah, let's leave it with that. Um, so we are all in the business of creating the future. But how do we go about it? Well, first of all, know what you are creating, right? This is, we all know STEM. We want to go into it. But I, I say, give it a little steam. Give it a little steam. We need to include arts into STEM. We need to include sociologists that observe the changes that are taking place caused by one line of code. We need linguists, philosophers, psychologists, all of these to understand. Shameless plug here, that's what we do in our Internet Institute in Czech Republic. We kind of bridge them because multidisciplinarity is key and I'm very, very glad to see speakers here that come from political science and all of that. I studied marketing, then I started economics and then social science of the Internet. Now I'm into law, so choo-choo. <clears throat> Let's go hop onto the train. <laughs> um, yeah, our age is the age of design. Let's make it a good one. And last of all, the challenge is not motivation, but governance of it. So think about the impact you have. If you code something, if you manage something, some teams, what do you code? Who do you hire? And um, this one. Great powers, great responsibilities, all of that. But it, it applies. We are badasses. If, uh, even if it doesn't show in your quarterly performance numbers. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. I'll join you on stage <laughs> for some questions. Um, so I will again take a question from the app and also the question from the audience. Uh, I would start with a question uh, asking like, how you deal with your personal data uh, and digital space. So do you have some recommendations saying, okay, so this is the first thing you should disable in your favorite app. Um, What's your recommendation regarding the data? <sighs> I'm, uh, I'm starting to think I'm the atypical one because my personal, personal opinion is I just let everything flow. I am the person, and I know this is not the case for everyone, but I am the person, to be honest with you, that opens everything and is like, they're not interested in Teresa. They are interested in my profile. And I'm conscious about what's taking place, how they are being handled, so that's why I choose to open the data, to enable technologies to get better. But I am creating a relationship with the system. I know what's happening so I can critically review it and choose if I want to function within those structures or not. But for people that are privacy oriented, I would say just read everything uh, or at least get get to know the platforms you're working, uh, working on or operating within the most. Maybe disable some things that you are not interested in or you don't want to happen. Because that's possible. You have the right to do so. It's just the reading. That's problematic right now. It's, we're working on it. We're working on it. How to simplify that. Thank you very much. Uh, and then a question from the audience. So there is one over there. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, you, you, you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Look at it. Yeah, get the microphone and just put it close to your mouth. Yes. Okay, thank you. I would like to ask you, do you think should there be more government regulations about uh, the internet, about the programming and so on, or it more depends on the programmers? What do you think? First of thank you. Very relevant. First of all, I think everybody should realize what the impact is. That's the first step, because that's 
not really the case right now. More regulation, less regulation. You know, we want to future-proof the regulation. So we regulate by principles and not by banning stuff that never works and innovation needs to thrive as it thrives right now. But I am all for less, more meaningful regulation in the sense of, for example, now European Union is kind of taking the power back from the companies by, for example, assembling the um, expert level group on AI ethics, which produced principles, guides. They are not perfect, nothing will, and no regulation nowadays is. But those are kind of guidance. So I would say yes. Um, I would say it's 50-50. It's you know, the accountability and responsibility is on each and every programmer and also the regulators. But I would say less regulation, more meaningful, you know, and especially if it um, resonates with the, for example, nation states value, nation states still have a power over um, the companies, for example, in Germany, the content takedown um, regulation. So, yeah, I, I think I'll leave it at that. It's a long, long debate we have. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you once again.